and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer into the temple. Coming to us straight, coming to us straight from Tennessee, and a man, of, a man of a th of a thousand portraits, and now, ma and now making his way into the world of role-playing games with the Wilds of Enoch, spelled with a Y, because you've got to make sure you get that in. The <laughs> one and only Grant Cooley. How are you doing tonight, man? No, I'm good. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Um, yeah, glad to be here. This is exciting. I am do. I am do. I'm gl glad to glad to hear that. Um, thank you for braving the hell of time zones and my and my and my paranoia about about them because even though it said Nashville on on the Kickstarter page, I've had some experiences where I can't where I can't really trust that anymore. <laughs> sure, yeah, home base doesn't mean anything. Uh, yeah, I'm in Central Time Zone, so I don't know where you're at, but uh, I'm in Central as I'm... well, which made this so much easier. <laughs> so much easier, yeah, but. I've had a few case. I've had a few cases where it's where the the location says one thing, which would indicate it a certain time zone, but the actual location was different. Sure, maybe the location manager was located one place, but the actual uh, creators or uh, the uh, the backers or whatever the the production team were somewhere else. I could see it. Well, the big example was C was C J Thompson, who when I when I talked with him about Gods and Masters. The location on Kickstarter said Portland, Oregon. So I figured, okay, that's one hour behind me. I can deal with that. Well, what I didn't know is that he spends half he spends half the year in Taiwan as a teacher, and I just happened <laughs> yeah, to contact him. That, that'd be a bit of a curveball. Yeah, you wouldn't. Uh, I I can't believe you couldn't intuit that clearly. Ugh, you dropped the ball clearly. I'm a monk, not a wizard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You could have divined it, maybe. Well, if you're a monk, I guess you're not a cleric, so. No, well, some sometimes monks pull double du pull double duty as pr as priests, but yeah, but I that's get, only in Taiwan. So, <laughs> well, I get the feeling if I did if I did pull double du duty as a priest, it would be it would be a um, it would be an exorcist to try and to try and purify people's cursed die. Oh man, that's uh, that would be a, a lucrative gig. I think uh, a lucrative gig, a lucrative gig, gig possibly. Uh, not one that I not one that I do because it's fun because it's fun to watch people botch. Yeah. Because remember, I remember when dice rollers, like uh, the little automatic dice rolling machines, uh, made a made a blip. I don't know if they're still around, but I remember. Gosh, it had to have been late TSR, early WotC days uh, when WotC took them over. When uh, there was a big surge, I guess with third edition three point five or something like that. But I just started seeing them like Gen Con, and they were like. Oh yeah, yeah. This way you can, you know, you roll it. I'm like, I, come on, guys. This is just it's 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 urban legend material right here. You're not, you can't roll the luck back into it. You can wear down your dice, I suppose, but yeah. But who I wants to use those? Old, to who wants to use it? those old know. ass dragon dice that would always wear out because they were made of crayon? Yeah, basically, they were made made on the the crushed hopes and dreams of all the TSR employees. Oh. Uh. I fig I figured it was made it was made out of Lorraine Williams crushed hopes and dreams from think from thinking that the Buck Rod that a Buck Rogers RPG in in um 1988 was a good idea. Kind of missed the boat on that one. Um, <laughs> well, I think it could. Sure, if short version short version, I'm not going to go through the whole history lesson. But she tr she tr but when she was running TSR. Um, she pushed for a um, TTRPG adaptation of Buck Rogers again in 1988. Yeah. When I don't, th I don't think, I think the amount of people who would have been interested in in that in that character were at a minimum, especially when if you, sure. if, I'd imagine if you if you quiz somebody on that sort of pulp SF, Flash Gordon is going to be the name that gets brought up. You know, yeah, oh, yeah and, and kind of should, you know, but uh, but we never would have thought we would have seen a BSG reboot, and uh, you know maybe that was the flagship or it could have been the flagship. You know, diehard fans make 
diehard projects and they stick by it. I mean, I say that still, you know, waiting for Firefly, but you know, Firefly has had a bit of a has had a bit of a renaissance when it comes to comics. Sure, but that's not the same. Yeah, it, it uh, that's, isn't. Oh, it's and... like a Buffy. You're like Buffy eight, you know. And I'm I'm uh, Scott Fisher is a beloved friend of mine. You know, doing the covers and all the art, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, it was a fan, but it was just like, ah, uh, you know what? I don't want to read this. I want to watch it and hang out with the gang for my episode. Not, you know, the stories were always the, the mythos was cool, but it was really watching the gang get together. Uh, same thing with Firefly. You know, you're like, oh, this is really cool. I don't want to see something else in the Firefly verse. I want to hang out with these people, even if we're just gonna like the, the end scene of Avengers. You know, if we're gonna go get Schwerma, I'm like, cool. I'll I'll take uh, I'll take that and just hang out with you guys for a bit. You know. If include plot i don't care you know <laughs> oh. so you would say absolutely not to the to the two firefly rpgs that have been created not absolutely not but the, the problem with those that you end up come up coming up with as uh you know as a dm and a gamer a long time gamer um i'm like i'm just like you and like anybody that's going to be listening to this mm-hmm. um is the limitations of any of your game are dependent upon the mindset of the players. It's like playing a social... It's, I, my go-to example is playing Masquerade forever and then playing Camarilla and live-action stuff forever. And you get people that play Toreadors or just social characters for people who didn't play it, um, play social characters who are incredibly not social. And they're like, oh, I've got majesty. Oh, I've got these abilities. I've got these social stats and characteristics but they can't play them. Whereas you could, if you could play them, you could bluff your way. I absolutely did bluff my way through things. Um, but I'm not necessarily the head all bold to me, but like we say, you know, and you play a social game or a social character or play Firefly. If you can't really get in that mindset, not just a love of it, but really understanding and being able to be tongue in cheek without being over the top and overly corny or appropriately corny, or, you know, chain of command beat you with it is one thing, but, um, you know, if, if you're relying upon material, spam a lot is another good example. Like, oh, come on, guys. Don't just use the source material. Get in the mindset and the headspace where they're at. If you can't do that, then your game is going to flop because it's going to be the same inside jokes that everybody knows. It's it's like Star Wars always saying, oh, I got a bad feeling about this. You're like, yeah. seriously? Is that the only phrase anybody knows in... You know, throughout the galaxy. That's so not even the. Fr- that's not even the quote from the film from the film that ended up in ended up in the AFI 100 list. <laughs> right, but yeah, you know, it's like so. So Firefly uh, is a great example of of like, oh man, that would be really it would be a really cool game, and you could put a lot of love into the development of it. And I didn't play it. Um, I've um I've played I've played the one that came out after Serenity and the one that came out sometime after. Th- Sometime after that, um, that used um, cor- both of them used Cortex. The original used the original Cortex, and the more recent one used Cortex Plus, and was all the better for it. But the solution that I that I would that I that I would utilize, and this is well, for one, I as a GM, I have I have a thing that I do where I where I write out like a one page primer of what we're running. Um, what sort of tone the mo- the adventure the um, campaign's gonna have and what I expect. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing is in the case of um, Firefly, up until the eleventh hour, I didn't tell them I was writing Firefly. I told them we were doing a space western. Oh, fantastic! Well, <laughs> oh, well, I guess there's a number of things that could fit that. But they're gonna set up for Doom World and they're gonna end up with Firefly, so that's gonna um, be different. But I had told I had told them I told them a space I told them a space western. I had to- I had said. I'd given them a short list of things as far as the um, appendix N. I think I told one person, "Think the good, the bad, and the ugly, but in space, and you'll be f- and you'll be um, not far off," which isn't inaccurate of a description. Um, there wasn't a lot of ugly in Firefly, though, so that that's the only thing. Everybody was very attractive. the The other thing, the other um, thing that I that I had done when I when I finally revealed it is, um. I made clear that th- that um that this w- that this was taking place after after Serenity and essentially essentially used it as a jumping ground for a se- for a second civil war because sure. 
you've seen, you've no doubt seen Serenity, and um, and I know some people might yell spoilers at me, but it's been long enough that the statute has passed. So, yes, yeah, so we're like 14, 15 years, something like that, if not more. I can't remember exactly. It's so. like yelling at me about. It's like yelling at me for spoiling the ending to Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> In certain crowds, sure. Oh, uh, but. I went with the idea that af after that um, broadcast was put was put out, that the that um for a lot of people it, for a lot of people clo closer to closer to the more to the inner more inner more um, territories, it didn't have that much of effect. But for the people on the out for the people on the outside, some of, a lot of them did not take kindly to it, and you end up with. Essentially, a, se a second generation of brown coats who call themselves the Dust Devils. Oh, oh. Uh. But then it also begs the question of why. Like, why? I mean, that's the cool uh, plot development. But uh, you know, when you're playing in that in the the verse, as it were, um, it, you know, it's like, why? What? Uh, why play there over somewhere else? And and why the, that source material? Because the, the, everything told, about that was the tone of. Truth be told, I did. You know, I did tongue, this tongue in cheek and clever. I approach. did this. I but did anyway, this that, that's neither here nor there. I yeah. mean, I, I've got nothing against <laughs> games that people want to play and they want to jump into that character. And if they want to be shiny, that's oh. rad. I'm I'm totally down for it. I uh, I generally think it's it's just um, it's a it's not impossible. And if you can pull it off and pull off a group that really has their head wrapped around it and not just. I did you know, this as slap a... some cogs on their their bowlers. Mm -hmm. um, you're, that's that's amazing, and you know clearly there there are groups that can do that that can channel can channel the essence of what they're trying to do, and they all get on the same page from a zero session onward and make uh, make something that's really memorable. Mm -hmm. So and for me, I did this. As, I did I'm, this I'm, I'm being a little challenge. salty, but I don't want to be I don't want to be a, a hater because it's it's cool. Whatever. No, my experiences I, aren't everybody no, else's, obviously. so it's, it's cool to hear that other people can, you know. I, I love that people keep putting out different games that are fan service games yeah. or um, or dedicated diehard games. It's it, it's cool to see people what what drives them and what games they want to make have happen. Yeah, I've, first off, I did this thing to an, to answer a dare because some because somebody had said to me that you couldn't do you couldn't run a um R, an RPG set set in Firefly's universe and. I hate being told. I hate being told what to do. <laughs> yeah, I've I've gathered that in our short uh, exchanges that I imagine your dander uh, was sig significantly raised at that. So, because uh, uh, because uh, and um, although e even with that, there are there are certain I there are certain IP that I will outright refuse to ru run. Um, two of them are Star Wars and Doctor Who. Um. At, at, or I, sh I should put in the caveat. I will. I'm willing to run them, but with some very specific um, restrictions. Because I'll use the Star Wars one as an as an example. Um, I all something a story that I always that always comes to mind when it comes to Star Wars games is Ralph Coster's ref um, relationship with Jedi when he was developing Star Wars Galaxies. He did not want Jedi in the game, and was adamant against adamant against it from for years. And his reasoning was that Jedi would become an alpha class, that everybody everybody would want to chase them because everybody wants to be Luke Skywalker. And eventually, his hand was forced. So he tried he tried to make it that you actually had to work to get it. But people eventually figured that out, so it was just it was just a bandage at, at best. But in the same in the same vein, as tempting as it would be to ha to have Jedi in a star in a Star Wars game that I that I'd be doing, um, I feel like that would be bottlenecking what you can do with that universe. Oh, absolutely. I, I think I mean as I've got a vast, tremendous love for Star Wars lore, expanded universe, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um. I love, I personally, the best system that I've ever played is the Genesis system, the Fantasy Flight Star Wars game. Mm -hmm. Love it. I, 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 
God, I'm actually going to develop a skin for the wilds uh, just because I want to play with, I love, I love those dice. I love the narrative mechanic. Um, but the problem with the star Wars universe is always going to be that power creep. And when you're like, I want to have a lightsaber, I want to have you like, no man, the best parts about star Wars, um, and or being proof positive like we can we can have these tremendous stories that don't have anything to do with jedi for the most part uh, mandalorian obviously a lot of fan of service gets kicked in in a delightful way then i love them but you can have the, it's it's all the exploration of the settings and the scenes i mean not dissimilar to to, to, to roll it to what i'm doing but uh the wilds of enoch is about setting it's about scene it's about narrative and it's there's really nothing you can do to break the game because having played games where suddenly Jedi or Sith break the game, where you're like, oh man, I went from this character that, uh, you know, I'm so thrilled that I get to fire my heavy blaster. And, you know, I'm, I'm finally rolling, uh, you know, more cool dice. I've got, I'm specialized in it and I'm rolling, you know, oh, I can roll triumphs more often or something. Um, and you're like, oh, and there's this Jedi that's, okay, there we go. And we're good. We're good. Or somebody was on that track or you've got an NPC, you're like, oh, well, you guys are demigods walking. Um, and the rest of us are, it, it makes you feel smaller, uh, yeah. in comparison to that, you know, and, to be, uh, whereas a Han Solo character, I mean, a scoundrel is amazing. Um, a Finn is a cool character, you know, characters that are proficient and knowledgeable in their universe that can navigate the, the highways and byways of the worlds is phenomenally engaging. Um, as opposed to someone who is just, you know, a, I don't know, it lives by a code and is a living weapon. And uh, not hating on uh, Jedi and Seth out there, just saying, like, from a role playing standpoint, you back yourself into a, a power a, a corner that power creep is going to overwhelm everybody who's not a Jedi in the group. And even when I have, even when I have allowed for allowed for it, I've um, I've ta I've taken steps to re I've taken steps to reinf to reinforce the to reinforce the whole um, knight errant or or samurai appro or samurai approach, although. An argument could an argument could be made of of, se of several of them leaning more into leaning unintentionally into wuxia, but that's another story entirely. Plus, um, I didn't I didn't I and I didn't even dive into that until I started learning about the lightsaber forms and how that can be used as a storytelling angle that a lot of people don't consider. Um, yeah, absolutely. The sword. I mean, the 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 saber forms are phenomenally cool um i, I yeah that, that's that's the, the you know sora forms and it yeah anyway that's that's a whole a whole yeah. different tangent whole different but, tangent entirely um uh, going it, down that rabbit hole but um i usually like to delve into the origin stories with pe with people so what would you what would you say is your was your gateway drug of sorts when it comes to role-playing games oh wow uh who well, um, playing who get well the gateway drug entirely um, uh, was uh, AD and D in uh, high school. Um, instead of going, you know, we'd go meet in the library and play uh, play straight up dungeon. Well, I mean AD and D, uh, Dungeon Dragons. You know, smuggling some miniatures in our coat pockets. Um, I guess I may I played a little bit. Oh, oh, I, I take it back. Sorry, that was my uh, that would be my mess. <laughs> My gateway drug was a hundred percent, and we mentioned it before the we started recording. Um, was uh, Palladium's uh, TMNT. Uh, huge fan uh, of the comics before the movie came out, um, and even the cartoon. But was a big fan when I was, I guess, ten. And uh, for my eleventh birthday, I got. Uh, I ended up getting the core book. And one of the expansions and something else. And I was blown away, a blown away by the artwork. Not just the Eastman and Laird stuff, but the Ladrone artwork in it was just mind blowing. Um, the system, um, played oh. it through college, played it, gave it a, get a good try for another 12, 15 years. And I still, I still am very fond of the idea that I'm going to go back because I still have all those books on my shelf. Mm -hmm. um, the art is still phenomenal. Uh, the concept is all awesome. Um, it's a wacky system of percentages um, that you can do anything. Um, but that was, that was my first, that was my first role-playing thing. 
Um, and but I did that so like I just devoured the books, and I I, I drew comics uh, for people in fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Uh, my closest friends that I still have to this day are people I drew comics with turtles and superhero stuff like that. But I did it. I played turtles. I like I'd make characters endlessly by myself and then draw them. Um, so so that was my my entrance. But then like the real thing that got me like oh I'm at the party was was playing AD and D in. Um, in eighth grade uh, on watching Conan um, and Robotech, uh, strangely enough, um, and playing with guys in, in, in high school and stuff like that. And then playing with older people, you know, who are upperclassmen and their cousins who were way older, who had at that time, they had a hundred minis and gelatinous cubes and Balrog minis and or Baylor models rather. And um, anyway, so that's a long answer. Sorry, just it's taking me down that thing of like, hey, when did I start doing that? Oh man, that's what I was doing. Yeah, and when you mentioned smuggling minis, I was I was reminded of my little experience when it came to a a no card playing rule that my that my high school had, which I which I managed to cheat by bringing in at in protest by bringing in Yahtzee. <laughs> they tried to get me in trouble about it. And I said, you said no card playing. There's no cards in Yahtzee. No cards in Yahtzee. No, you're gambling. Except that, um, except none of us were. We we brought the thing out because we'd always come in an hour early, be, and we'd have nothing to do. Sure. No, that was that was definitely that was definitely part of the the high school experience until I got into martial arts. Was uh, uh, well, even after, but like especially before, it was getting there to school early playing for 15 30 minutes like even just talking about D. and then matt well magic had, had come out a few uh slightly beforehand uh no actually it, it came out when i was a sophomore so we get together we play a round or two of magic uh real quickly and before class started and then we'd role play at lunch mm -hmm. and then um, get together somewhere later on that day to uh to play super enhanced rpg games yeah i never got shoved in any locker rooms or any lockers, largely because I was too big, and also because well, the one t the one time somebody tried it, I ended up retaliating because they were on the football team, and I paid I paid somebody to ch to um, change the combinations on all the locks. I'd do it. <laughs> oh. I have people steal my magic cards and uh, throw them in the uh, the sinks at the uh, the school in the Y. That wasn't fun, um, <laughs> but I you know whatever. <laughs> oh. Oh, that that and there was, there was the there was the one it, there was the one instance where some where somebody really thought really thought that they could get, get me and um, they, what I happened to find out that they that they did not leave the trunk of their, the trunk of their car, um, locked. So I did a little thing called Pepsi bombing. Which is just I'm not... is a fancy way of saying I dro I dropped a dozen cans of a dozen cans of Pepsi into into their trunk in the middle of winter. Oh gosh! <laughs> no, we would just uh, we would get like a half dozen of because I, I I roll in a bunch of different circles. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't really fit in too too much, especially by sophomore year. I was six two, um, but uh, you know, some of my friends that I role played with, you know, because yeah. they here in the South too, especially there's there's no limitation on who digs this stuff. Uh, oddly enough. But I, you know, a couple of friends uh, who were on the wrestling team, and then all of us who were definitely not, um, and we would just go pick up somebody's car and move it from parking lot to parking lot. It's way easier when you're talking about, you know, a half a ton Datsun, uh, but uh, we we just physically moved their car, um, which you know is a thing. Yeah. So don't recommend it now, but. Now, with with the wilds of Enoch, I I might be able to make a, f a few guesses. O obviously, it's leaning into space opera, but what what sort of material would you put in the appendix N for for that? As far as books, films, t TV, comics, etc., that served as inspiration for it. Fantastic question. This is probably just gonna be like the the gateway drug. Um, that is a really great question. Um, I grew up, and now I'm not, I don't know to what measure these things in most, but I definitely can say that they have. I grew up watching um, uh, PBS airings of Doctor Who, Tom Baker, um, Pertwee, 
uh, Davison, you know, like that's, that's what I grew up watching with my mom when, um, you know, I was eight, nine, stuff like that. Um, and I know I, I just, just the first thing off the cuff, like that, uh, even like some of the alien designs, um, BBC, especially back in the day, but they've carried it through. BBC's uh, creative scope has always far exceeded their ability to manifest it, but it was the concepts that they were putting forward that was phenomenal. You know, Roddenberry to to a certain extent, um, but you know, especially Doctor Who putting out um, just these incredibly progressive, mind bending things that there's no way they they there you couldn't represent them today. Uh, some of some of the Solarans and, and different things that you're like, oh, what? Um, so there's definitely a, a helping of um, relatable, real, as, as much as I can say this, uh, relatable, real world conflict with your alien physiology and societies that most of the Doctor Who uh, big bads or minor bads, even, even going back to... Um, the first doctor or to the Hartnell stuff, um, they tended to have this society or motivation. It was rarely, I'm bad and I will destroy the things. I um, seem to remember a couple, a couple scenes that outright made fun, outright made fun of that with that whole, you wouldn't even know what to do if you, re if you took over the world other than shout at it. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and so I, that's definitely going to be a key influence. And I, you know, I still love Doctor Who, but I've fallen off the wagon. It, it, it's, it's me being a salty old weirdo that, like, when it became really popular, I was just like, okay, well, this was something I cherished and loved for a long time. And I loved Eccleston, and uh, Smith was fine. Tennant, of course, was amazing. But anyway, that, that's a whole different thing. Mm -hmm. anyway, I love Doctor Who. I love the mythos more than even just the doctors and the personality that comes with that was this mythos that you could have these aliens that have co-inhabited Earth or live elsewhere that have whole societies. It's not just, you know, Mars attacks. Um, so Doctor Who is a big one. Star Wars, of course, is a huge one. Having these livable planets, having these societies, having this galactic society is a huge prevalent theme in Enoch. And something that I, I you know, I've already got expansions and expansions and expansions planned to really set forth what the universe looks like so it's not just this singular focus that we want to have space battles and we want to do things it's a lived in space and you were talking earlier about firefly was lived in mm -hmm. um and or mandalorian these spaces now feel lived in where you have these everyday scenes you have these gutter trash scenes you have these market scenes they are aliens co-inhabiting that have a thriving society so for me when i'm writing for enoch and developing these things um it's it's a focus on what what would that really look like really trying to honor the concept because it's not just uh, i don't want to put out gimmicks and you know i just hot flashes of of concept i want it to be well with if if this then this if if that then this mm -hmm. that it, i'm walking that through with artwork i'm walking that through with uh the comics I'm writing for it, I'm walking that through with the modules, and so it's it's each thing builds and leans to the other thing. So we say Doctor Who, we say Star Trek, uh, we say um, Star Wars. Um, I happen to own a comic shop that you know I helped uh, start up 18 years ago. Um, comics are my life. Uh, they still, I mean, I'm not I'm not up on as much new stuff now because I've, you know, I'm not. Um, but you know, your old Claremont writing, uh, your X-Men stuff like that, again, um, taking concepts and not just making it uh, fantastic four smashes the thing. And you're, you know, take dark Phoenix saga where it's, it's characters living in a space, dealing with consequences, having the Shi'ar empire come in and be aliens that have a motivation other than we will destroy the earth. You're like, no, you, this is our mythos. This is why these are legends of the things. Um, so you know definitely comics um gosh i you know i, mm -hmm. I, I could go on and on i am trying not to I'm, but then it's like i'm looking around the room going like well i'm also an avid transformers fan i'm at these things and they all come back to inform it where i go like i get I, i'll simplify it and stop going because i mean yeah. i'm sure I, I could and it would be my own fan service um it's taking the parts from um enoch, enoch thrives and dwells in a place where um, 
intergalactic species live in their space. They have a history, they have a culture, they have a society, they have their own motivations. Half of the book is uh, devoted to character motivation, societal placements, and things that uh, would be commonly adopted by these types of player characters or rejected for a certain number of reasons. So that you're not just playing that smashy smashy, uh, you're not playing that min-max dealio. Um, you are, you can, but you have this option of like, oh, I want to connect with what what would motivate this character, how would they interact with society, and all that comes from these influences that I, I named, and you could go on and on. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this just lived in spaces, I think more than anything. I, I'm sorry, I, I did start to uh, been making rum and cokes here as we were getting to go uh to to loosen the tongue as it were um it's it's lived in spaces that feel that they are populated and viable that you can connect with so that you're thinking about the game after you've rolled the dice after you've put it away you're thinking about what your character did what your character will discover what things they want to do in the world um that in past sessions or different groups have been magnificent where I feel like, man, this is a oh, iron throne. This was so cool. Oh, these things are so badass. I love this. Uh, two other things where you just rolled some dice and you became, you know, an epic character and you're taking on uh, loth or something like that, you know, that have their own thing. But, you know, I, I I'm focusing on those lived in spaces that these mm -hmm. predominantly sci-fi universes bring. Yeah. And for me, I was I was a bit curious if um if so, if um more if more pulpy types of sci-fi were were a significant influence. Yes, uh, you know, but honestly, my more of my roots came from um, aside from uh, well, reading reading the actual the Doctor Who novels again on my eleventh birthday. I got Turtles, and I also got uh, some of the uh, the old Doctor Who novels. I want to say Terrence Howard, but uh, Phillips. I don't know. I can't remember. Um, Again, I've been drinking. I can pull them off the shelf somewhere. Um, reading those and being like, "Oh, this is awesome!" and uh, some other titles elude me. You know, or, or later on, like Greg Bear and Orson Scott Card, things like that that aren't pulpy, but are. Uh, but uh, the old, your old um, Flash Gordon. Uh, we were talking about that before. Uh, the old, uh, the uh, old. Gosh, I'm pulling them out right in front of me right now. Mm -hmm. That stuff was the gold. The old, the, you know, just. Anyway, yes, uh, Alex Raymond's old Flash Gordon stuff is is amazing, and I mean that's comics. Um, but yeah, absolutely. But it's also the pulpy, uh, the pulpy uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs. It's your uh, Robert E. Howard. It's your. I mean, obviously Lovecraft. All these things that are big influence, but they are. It was their their pulp roots where they were just writing stuff and talking and commiserating and and creating all these things. It's those. Um, I mean, I used to devour old pulp science fiction books too. That I couldn't, if you showed it to me for now, I'd be like, oh, of course, clearly that's somebody doing something awesome. But it would just, I would go get it from the library. I'd go get it from a bookstore and just read it mm -hmm. and devour it and move on until, you know, I, I became, you know, especially uh, junior high and stuff like that and started reading more, more established fiction. And if Michael Whalen was on the cover, I, I read it from 1991 through uh 2001 um but uh Give but yeah anyway sorry I, again i i, I the uh, the more i drink the more I, <laughs> the more i talk which doesn't necessarily equate to uh succinctness but it's yeah it's that is those pulpy roots again because those spaces are lived in those are the concept dominated the fiction and they they honored the concept by reinforcing it and grounding it they, you know, technology or special effects or certain levels of imagination uh, hadn't been explored as thoroughly, uh, especially talking about like Flash Gordon, you know, old, old uh, cylindrical, crazy rocket ships. Um, but their concepts were there. They were thinking in those those wavelengths. They were they were approaching these concepts with curiosity and like, OK, that's going to be our setting. But what we're going to deal with is interspecies conflict and how to disarm whatever or how to escalate uh interplanetary conflict or i don't know um mm -hmm. but they, they they dealt with like real real concepts in a fictional setting and that's what really grabbed me yeah now with with all that with all that in mind 
one of the one of the key things that you mentioned right at the top of the Kickstarter page is is mixing mixing that bit of science fiction with what you refer to as elemental shamanism. Sure. So, what exa what exactly is meant but is meant by that? I'm no I'm certainly no stranger to shamanism, especially being a being a fan of um of RuneQuest that that I am, but. But um, that can mean different things to different people. So I'd like, so I'd like to see where your direction is. Absolutely, and uh, we we talked about it last night the the Q and A on the Random Worlds uh, RPG Discord. Um, because it can mean a lot of things. In our sense, what you have is you have these um, primordial elemental abilities that, that some races inherently manifest and. Uh, preserve. The Sula are aquatic telepaths. They are also hydromancers. Not all of them. Um, they're in it telepaths. They all are, uh, barring some mutation. But there are a large population of them are that are hydromancers that, based on their environment and the way they manipulate their environment. Um, your Koshik are they manipulate the dark matter between or non-existent matter between dimensions because they're void walkers. So they manipulate this non-existent yet existent shadowy substance and the gravity between those things as a racial ability based on their racial history that is, is divulged in the, the story and will be expanded upon in their, um, their splat book that, that's in the works. Um, you have the Mara that are literally the chronic there. I mean, they're, 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 basic classes called the chroniclers they have safeguarded and witnessed all of the galactic record that exists because they're the people that they're the race the species that started keeping the galactic record and they are these um sentient silicate beings that can shape shift that have an igneous core that are made up all of all these strata and, and different um silicate matter um so they they have their own elemental affinity and manipulation that comes with their very being and existence. Mm -hmm. So you have these, and this, so that's that's more of the shamanism that comes with um, a natural state relationship and manipulation of primordial forces. Um, but then you also have the uh, you have these mutations that are developing with humanity um they refer to themselves earthkins on uh, on enoch after their exodus from earth but after several several generations in a couple hundred generations in these mutations are starting to pop up with um these developments with these uh, elemental affinities you have the nephilim that are these first like truly cross an ocean breed of they're no longer humans so to speak they're humanoids and that you know they look like people but they have these elemental affinities that can um that can manifest powers abilities or just uh, affinity is the best way that they, mm -hmm. they can influence these elements uh, based in certain directions you have the gregory that have this mysterious that will be revealed a mysterious meta connection to um primordial life forces that have that manifest in their characters with their their healing abilities or their uh commanding word there's something else going on with them so it's like it's like when we say elemental shamanism you want to get I, for me i want to get away from um being uh, a mage or something like that so a disarming term and, and, and a very uh, viable question mark is like what well, what do you mean by elemental shamanism it's creating a system by which you can have these dynamic forces at play that are more than just technology or biology that become that they're just dynamic that you can they're that extra bit of exclamation point that is tied to an existing racial component species component um societal component that, that has some some tether so it's not just i do these awesome things like well there's a reason why you do them and you're going to feel that connection every time you do them there's a reason and a consequence and uh so we're not just shooting lightning bolts um which is fine but in this setting it would be inappropriate because it's it's generally a, an atmosphere of connection mystery intrigue and uh divulged revelations of what's going on, on the planet mm -hmm. now i would like to ship i would like to keep on mechanics for a bit for a bit and shift huh. into the shift into the core mechanic that you guys ha that you guys have. Sure. So you talk about mix about mixing a 
about mix about mixing a die mechanic with deck crafting, and I think I think in the Kickstarter page itself you talk about uh, mixing in um, deck building. Mm -hmm. But this, but whenever I whenever I look at mechanics, I'm always the first thing I'm always looking at is is the all roads lead to Rome, i.e. that one that one die system, that one die approach whether it be a formula or something else, and it doesn't even have to be die, but this is the one mechanic that whenever a situation calls for um, success or f a success or failure possibility, um, this is what's used. Whether it be the pounds of d6s you see in Shadowrun, or the or the roll high, or the roll high d10s you see in World of Darkness, or the um, percentile approaches. You see in stuff like war, stuff like um, Warhammer Forty Thousand, uh, especially the Fantasy Flight games run, or um, e or even the blackjack like approach of Fading Suns. What is that Rome in that case for Enoch? Uh, succinctly, that would be difficult to answer, or maybe not. I don't know. Again, uh, I'm trying to wrap my head around the question. So, for what what would be your um, your driving force here? Uh, it's it's an overused term, but it really is the driving. Con Let me start with the driving concept. Top down is narrative, 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 narrative. I love the Genesis system, as I mentioned before, and would mention a million times over. I love narrative dice because it's not just I did a thing. And I either did it or I didn't. I could do a thing, but also have a consequence. I could fail to do a thing, but have a positive consequence. Having some variability in what the mechanic presents to you. Because it's very easy to get very linear and focused on what you're trying to do as a character. Um, sometimes with the best of narrative intentions, and the other times with just, I need to smashy, smashy, and get that, get that taken care of. Um, all, all things being fine. The motivation for the system that we developed was all narrative and it started with tons of dice you know talking to rob schwab who did uh, shadow the demon lord um green ronin press um long time guy at the shop and in, in murfreesboro that um i had but also has gone on you know he, he's got a legacy that extends beyond his own endeavors you know with dnd with &D and stuff like that but he's like oh people love to roll dice so we started off with tons of dice because i loved world of darkness i loved rolling a ton of d10s and looking for those open-ended zeros i'll be like yes man and sometimes it'd be nothing more than I'm driving a car. Man, I am driving the crap out of this car. There is no way that, you know, and it'd be like playing Sabat and be like, great, I'm, I'm glad I wasted all my 10s on this. Um, Mage players are laughing at you. Yeah, they're like, great, cool, that's awesome. You're definitely getting staked by, uh, by setup. But um, it, with Enoch, we started with all these different mechanics and all oh, tons of dice and tons of things. Oh, it was super crunchy. And it's still, you know, we, we have had feedback that it's still crunchy. And I think the state where it's at now is about, it's about as crunchy as I would ever want it. I um, mean, we talked about this, uh, you know, I was typing it up last night with the, the Discord. So at least it's fresh on my mind. Narrative top down. The next thing is I want players to be able to do what they're trying to do. Um, I don't. It's not. A, it's not a DM versus players environment. I'm not trying. It's not player kill motivation. Uh, the idea is that people will be able to walk through, uh, walk, struggle, run, whatever, through a module, creating new content as they go, new to motivations and new atmosphere with their decisions and the way they interact with the things that are, the situations that they are presented with, not just the creatures or monsters that they're thrown at. So for us, the, the way that it manifests now is you have uh, with the deck crafting and the dice. The deck crafting is mostly for combat. You're going to start with a basic deck that is going to be augmented by the abilities that you purchase. You're going to take out bad cards, add more good cards. You're going to dilute the deck with uh, better cards. Um, in not dissimilar from other deck crafting or deck building mechanics where you're going to create a, a variable timing mechanic where you're going to have that hand that's amazing and maybe the next hand isn't going to be amazing and it's it's representing in game time that oh i've got to i've got to recoup because last round i laid down a hail of minigun fire that uh allowed us to do whatever well i'm exhausted uh, maybe i should scamper over for cover maybe i should do whatever um i should choose a different path um the deck is really neat because it, it's limited by the content 
and it's based on different levels of power and attacks that you could do with the cards. Uh, mishaps that augment. So it's, it's basically your threat of failure um, because, you know, you do always need to have that possibility that you could roll that natural one because that does happen. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, your Rambo is going to trip over a root every now and then. Um, and I won't go too much of that, but like the, the deck mechanic was designed to be a timing mechanic as well as a variable situational mechanic. Even if you, you do the same thing every time, say I, I, I throw my axe, I swing my sword, in this case, I fire my LAS pistol or do my thing. The outcome will change almost certainly from round to round. And hopefully, more often than not, players will be trained to think more on the fly rather than I have this program mechanic that I'm going to cast bull strength and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do whatever. In Enoch, they're going to think on the fly a little bit more. And it, you don't have to, but... It, it certainly presents an opportunity to create a narrative mechanic by which you can be motivated to think differently, to choose different paths based on what the cards are presenting you. And then those cards are presented to you by the, the choices you made as you've done your training or you've built your character. Um, and we can, we can go on uh, mm-hmm. that more, or you know, I'll, I'll present that material. Um, the other half of the thing, our skill checks are, well, well, even with the, the, the decks, you're still rolling dice for the outcome. So we're using D6 throughout the whole thing. D6 plus cards for combat, D6 plus your stats for skill checks. Um, so it's not necessarily a, you have two roads that, you have a two-lane highway that leads to Rome. Um, your D6 for your skill checks is based on, you have two key terms, which outside of a tactile, because it's a very tactile game in that sense, um, without having it in front of you, it's, it's, it's kind of a nebulous concept, but bearing with me in presenting it, you have two basic conditions. You have a threshold value and a, and a RNS, a required number of successes. Your threshold value is how difficult it would be for you to do a thing. Your required number of successes is how long or how much of the thing you would have to do. If you were trying, we were trying, the example that came up last night was, I want to climb a, sk- uh, a, a cliff face. Be like, okay, well, cool. We're going to set a threshold value. The, the one I set forward was we're going to set a threshold value of three. You roll three or less, you succeed. You you base that how many dice your dice pool is based on the stat that you're going to use. I'm either going to be very strong and I'm just going to, I can pull myself up. It's no thing at all for me to hang Stallone style cliffhanger by a few fingers. Uh, or I'm so agile that I parkour my way up this thing. So you use your strength or agility. It sets, oh, I've got four dice. I've got a strength of four. I need threes or less. And the other component, the RNS, the required number of successes, is like, well, how tall is the cliff, cliff face? How long are you going to be climbing it? Mm-hmm. Do I want to set a required number of successes that says, okay, by the time you hit the successes, that's how long it took you to scale that cliff face. So some things will be like, oh, it's going to take me, uh, I need five. Well, I'm not going to hit that in one roll, but that's going to say I'm maybe going to hit it in two rounds. Maybe some people are going to hit it in three. Maybe there's a mechanic behind you where you have some creepy crawly running up the thing. is like, well, something's going to happen in the meantime. And I don't want to get too much off tangent, but the idea being setting challenges by the difficulty by which they would, um, the in it difficulty of the challenge and their ability to, to do it. Other things will be, I'm going to set this as hard. There's a... There's a boulder coming my way. I want, I'm going to dodge out of the way. Well, there's no, there's a required number of success of one because you either did it or you didn't. And you got, uh, you either Indiana Jones did or you didn't. Um, so you say, well, it's going to be hard to get out of the way. I'm going to set that threshold value of two. I need two or I need twos or less on these dice. Well, I'm rolling four dice. All I need is one. It's like, it's hard to do, but you only need to do it once. Or I'm climbing a a cliff face, or I'm hacking into a computer, or uh, think about aliens. Uh, You know, they're they're trying to hack through the door, and uh, they're like, oh, come on, we got to get through. through." Meanwhile, aliens are dropping down through the ceiling. You're like, ah, no, we got to do this thing. We got this thing. Uh, Rourke, wasn't his name? Um, Anyway, like, ah, they're screaming. It's like, so you've got this timing mechanic that maybe it takes longer. Maybe things are happening in the time that it took you to do it. Um, but it's it's setting up that narrative mechanic that says, it's not always going to be, I have climb. I made my climb check. I'm good to climb. I don't have climb. Oh, man, it's I'm not going to be able to climb that well. Um, or 
you should be able to do that. The example I brought up last night, which is my favorite thing to, to accompany, which isn't going to happen that often, but say it's something easy that you should be able to do. I am this buff guy and I'm going to jump over that hurdle for whatever reason. Um, I'm going to jump over that log. We're running through the woods. Oh, I'm going to jump over that log. Cool. You've got four dice and you need fours and you botch it. Be like, going forward, the crew is going to remember that. They're going to be like, oh, you, no matter how tough and awesome you are, how, no matter how you, you carry out on your back in the middle of a, a hail storm of la laser fire, they're going to be like, well, just don't put a log in front of Wurzbowski. Otherwise, we're all doomed. Um, so now that, um, that, was a, that, was a, that was a long rant about it. But it's, yeah. it's these two mechanics that create a dynamic force for combat and a related but separate dynamic that says um, your skill checks and your abilities, these things can still be narrative within a pass fail system. I can get I can get the narrative part, but um, with all, with all due respect, I think you I think you ended up get, going off going off the rails a little bit. The re oh, I hundred percent. I have no doubt that I have the <laughs> the reason why I why I use the Rome thing is um oh the fr as, as the saying goes, all roads lead to Rome. Um, any time. If if I am if I am attempting an action in World of Darkness, um, no matter how dice goblin-y some, somebody is, it's always a case of attribute plus skill in D10s. Try try and get try and get um, try and get eight. Try and get um, a, a bunch of die over eight, and compare and compare that to a minimum. Sure. Um, if I'm if I'm doing an action in Legend of the Five Rings. I roll. I roll the attribute and skill. I keep the attribute. Tens explode. That's that's the kind. That's the kind of thing that I'm that I was asking about. And since you mentioned that this is using d sixes, is it something like Shadowrun where four, where four and higher is a, is a six is a hit and things below that are misses, or do you have a different approach to six sided die? Gotcha. It is the opposite. Um... So you're looking for less than, sorry. Uh, it's uh, So when a stat is presented or a challenge is presented, you're looking for that equal to or less than. The higher the number, the easier it is to do or the stronger the thing is. Um, the lower the number, the harder it is to do. Um, if that makes sense. So you, if you, again, if I have a strength of four, I have four dice in that pool to make a, a, a strength-related skill check. Mm -hmm. um, it's it says I need threes. I'm rolling four dice. It says the threshold value is three. I'm rolling four dice, and I'm looking for threes or less. Mm -hmm. um, in cases where that needs multiple successes, that has a different um, a play out, which is of course explained in the book. Yeah. Um, but also, additional successes can lead to an additional narrative effect. Um, in the example of I dodge the boulder, um, so that really that'd be thing, degrees of that'd be degrees yeah. of success. Um, exactly. Then that narrative component means like I didn't just get out of the way of the boulder; I pivoted off these things, spun around, uh, and now I'm in a position of advantage. Yeah. Or you know, like our flourish. That's just like man. If they throw now, boulders at us, Wurzbowski's got it covered. Now. Within that, within that, the other part I wanted to ask is where is where sk where skills come to play into into that kind of role. Sure. So you have a very simplified level of uh, layer of skills. Uh, off the top of my head, I want to say sixteen to twenty ish. Um, it's not a, an expansive skill list uh, like D and D, where you know you, you've got everything broken down. They're more D &D simplified. skill list is t is tame compared to some of the stuff I saw in the nineties. Sure, absolutely. Well, I mean, I, again, I, I came from Turtles, where you're like, we will outline everything, and you are going to generate a number, uh, a percentage, eleven percent, for you to be able to cook eggs. I raised you, know. you one Phoenix Command. I haven't played it, and it doesn't sound like I want to. <laughs> I love, I love the in-depth things that people do, but I'd rather you be able to just imagine it and explain it than have to have a mechanic for it. You, um, it's which, important to strike a balance. If you do, yeah, if there's too much imagine. You're not playing a game anymore. You're doing it. You're doing improv theater. 
Um, True. Very, very good point. And, it is a very good point. And we want to, we want to feel the action. We want to feel the weight of success and consequence mm-hmm. uh, for sure. So in, the, in our case, uh, the skills are, are, are directly tied um, to, to be able to do a great number of things. I don't, I don't know how to put it any better. Like, so like you, if you athletics is a skill that you would have athletics applies to a lot of different things. Um, you could have uh, survival. I'm, I'm, I'm pulling up the list right now because I don't want to just completely run off the cuff for all this. Um, but you'll have skills that could suit multiple circumstances in the same way that I've tried to present your stats uh, your your vital statistics, your strength, knowledge, wits, wisdom, things, agility, that you might be able to say, like, you could make a pressing case for um, that I am going to use strength over agility because I'm a very strength-oriented thing, and uh, this is how I want to, like, I'm an endurance. I, I can take this hit. Or um, I'm, I'm looking at the list right now. It's things that are more broad-based. Technology, yeah. perception, but, navigation, communication. Um, you went... You ended up get you ended up getting off off the rails again because uh, I'm sure I'm sure. So I'm I'm just trying to get back to your question. Like the skills, the way it works is so if you have an applicable skill and you have up to three levels of that skill at the first tra- level of training, you you can make skill based checks that require that. Let's say you have level one of technology, you can perform technology checks because sometimes you won't. You can't Sandra Bullock uh, the net hack into the Pentagon just by tapping the keys. Um, if you have technology as a level one skill, there are checks that you'd be able to do or, uh, intimidate any, any, any of those things will have it. There should be a situation that presents itself where you will have non-skilled versus skilled, uh, trained checks at level two, you get a reroll for a check with that skill, uh, per session at level three, you get a reroll per encounter. You are all up in whatever that is, uh, whether it be perception, technology, gravity training, survival, whatever those situations present, you are living that life. You are always in that mode. Um, so it, though, that's, that's really the only thing that comes with skill checks is just like you either can do it or can't, or you do it better. Now, abilities, so you have skills that are a simplified system of um, environmental well, skill checks, you know, the stuff that's happening, how you're interacting with your environment, how you're reacting to your environment. Abilities can augment those things. Some abilities will give you automatic successes in certain skill checks uh, because you, again, you're living that life so hard. There's no reason why you would ever fail to do that thing. Um, or it would, it would have to be monumental. There would have to be a, an overpowering reason why you failed that. Going back to that narrative sense of you're trying to do a cool thing. I want you to do that cool thing. I want you to feel the weight of consequence. What happens if you don't do that thing? So dice matter, but doing it awesome creates really cool stuff. Otherwise we wouldn't have heroic moments Mm -hmm. that we do in all of our fiction and our, our, you know, our stories. If McLean had, you know, jumped off the, uh, the roof of, uh, you know, the towers and uh, the fire hose had failed to unwind and he fell down dead. It'd be like, Oh, well that was just uh Nakatomi Plaza was never going to be the same. To that, to that end, to get to get thi- to get things back to get things back on the on the uh, rails. Um, you mentioned that the fir- for the first three ranks of a skill, that that just determines that you can do you can do that you can do skills you can do um checks that require that skill. Um, given that, the question that I'd ha- I'd have is what's the be- what's the benefit from go. From going one rank to the to the next rank, is it a case where um, certain actions are going to require a certain sk- a certain skill level? O- otherwise, you'd end up having to do them at a disadvantage. Yeah, that's a better way of putting it. Um, you get better at doing them. Uh, aside from having some checks, you can make that you don't have to be proficient in that skill because you just would have a chance to do it. Uh, there's consequences for that in, in the mechanic. But um, as far as purchasing skills, they're not overly expensive. And since you can only go up to three ranks, it's, it's not that you're ever going to be so amazing at a thing that you always succeed at it. It's just we're, we're, we're hedging your bets and stacking those odds. We're like, oh, well, yeah, cool. And there's a lot of different ways to get those skill levels up. Because, again, I want you to make some choices and bolster your character. I don't want to pigeonhole them. But I wanted to be like, oh, cool! I'm really focused, and I do these things. You know, sometimes there are, are utility skills that everybody should want to have, 
but it's interesting. It's always been interesting to me when characters don't take those skills. Uh, say your perception based skills. You're like, oh, I'm going to make a witch check or I'm going to do this. Knowing traps and monsters and everything are wailing away. He's like, no, nah, I don't really care about that because I'm so strong and tough. I'm not, I'm, I just don't care. So you go last in initiative and you don't detect the traps and you don't do whatever. There's, there's a neat narrative mechanic that comes from intentionally neglecting advantageous skills. And what I've tried to do is create a system by where um, some of those utilities are going to be commonly used because they are, but implementing those other things as well. So that, and what I mean by that is that it's not just, I'm going to go heavy into these ones and the other, because you never use the other ones. There are a few that are very specific that are narrative based, but most of them will have an option or you can make a case for it that says, now, you know what, I'm going to use my engineering skill to disarm this bomb. You'd be like, well, it's a demolition check. It's like, yeah, but I know the way things work. I see how this is set up and I'm going to do this thing. So developing your skill list by your characters is a narrative approach, but then hedging your bets when you're going back to your question of like, well, why take more ranks or what are you going to do with it? It's, um, it's not an issue of why it's, some, it's, some, it's more of making sure, making sure that going from one to two is going to have um, its own impact. It will. There will be checks that require, um, especially in the uprising of lifting, the campaign that I'm working on now, there's uh, a developed affinity that you need to, ha need to have for certain checks. In the core modules that are presented, it's going to be more, okay, can you make the check if it's a skilled-related check and you have to have the skill? Okay, your tech guy, your demolitions guy, whatever the thing is. Okay, you've got the check. The second level is really um, some abilities require you to have multiple ranks to get to those those level six abilities, level five, level six abilities. So I like, go, oh, you got to be, you really got to be committed to doing these things to unlock certain tech trees, uh, so to speak. It's that third level that really being able to reroll per encounter um, is a big deal, uh, as you can imagine. You'd be like, oh, cool. I, you know, I, I could go on a list. Uh, it's uh, again technology. I'm, 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 we're trying to disarm uh, or, or, or break into the system. Well, I really do this. I should be able to do this. Okay. Well, you know, there's your other chance at doing it. If you didn't, that's fine. Things just don't always work out. You know, sometimes the alarm saxons go off, and it's it's that. So I, what I wanted to do was there to be an to feel the impact of those things without it, you know, being instead of taking it to level four, five, six, where it becomes this omnipotent ability. You're like, no, no. Level three is really advantageous. Level one is fine. Um, you're not going to be left in the dark. You still have a shot to do the thing. I want you to be, I want people to be able to go, oh, and, you know, actually I, I have taken training. I've messed around because I've done heads up displays and stuff like that. Let me give a try. Let me lend you a die. Let's, let's, let's focus on this thing together. Um, give you a bonus die. Um, I don't, I don't like setting things. I love level six abilities in this case, or, you know, other systems. It's normally level six or level 10 or something like that. We're like, oh man, I unlocked my, god mode oh that's so cool i do this thing uh, I'm, I'm a zamishi oh i do or zemich I, I can't remember how to pronounce it but we all call you zamishi um i do this horrid form i do this awesome stuff that's that stuff's always really cool and engaging i want to save that for focused moments of narrative thing and the skills aren't where that's at does that, does that make sense yeah oh. the skills are utility and narrative focused to allow missions to play out and scenarios to unfold. Uh, the real meat where you're slinging, you know, predator level spears is is in your abilities. Mm -hmm. Now, with the, now getting into setting a, a little bit, uh, I always ask this question whenever I'm dealing with any sort of space opera game that involves um, travel across well space. But how? How does interstellar travel work? Is it a is it a case where it's a where you're jump you're jumping into a separate kind of space, a la a la warping or or light speed? Is it a case where you can only um, jump between specific um, points, like a la Wing Commander or or Cowboy Bebop, or is it some mix between the two? Uh, neither at this point. Uh, it took everything humanity had to get to Enoch and so far we're dealing with the aftermath of them settling 
Uh, you have one, you have the uh, Greater Russo Alliance that, that lives up in space in the, the fragmented sections of a moon. Um, the Koshik splat book. So each of the splat books I'm developing for the um, each of the races will further the meta story and unfold more of the narrative, as well as unlocking additional races or uh, additional abilities, classes, uh, to put it succinctly, to to unlock more playable content. The idea that that part hasn't been developed um, because there I've tried to establish the galactic society that. Two of the races have their the home worlds were destroyed or corrupted, and they live on Enoch. The humans have taken to getting here, and it's all they've got. When these other things unfold with these other books, what I would like to do is have it be more uh, uh, mass effecty, you know, or Bebop's a good example. But you know, like okay, I jump to these points in this solar system, and these are planets by which I would want to engage in. The others. You know, I'm not going to do resource farming or anything like that, but um, I've already set the framework, started to set the framework for other alien species, other home worlds, and an ongoing narrative that is fueled by these massive meta concepts. So I don't want to give anything away without, and, and, and also commit to them. Um, so those things aren't present in the game now, but the, my plan is to incorporate more of that jump system that says, I jump from this solar system to this group of planets. I jump from here to there uh, to focus the narrative uh, on certain worlds. Yeah, and to be fair, to be fair, if I had if I had to use a tabletop example, I'd br I'd bring up um, Fading Suns, which which also utilized that that whole. Um, that whole jump point mechanic, the idea that it's possible, but only between, so only between certain um, in and out points. Uh, whereas something like Star Wars, light speed is ju is jumping into is jumping into subspace by accelerating at a specific amount of um, amount of distance over time. Sure. Um, so and well, here's what it's worth. The narrative I've set up is um, humanity. They had to they. There's stuff in the book. There's a fluff. Um, they received the coordinates for Enoch and developed the rudimentary concepts of um, how to get there. And the way they did it was they they would construct a gate after testing. And there's all the again, it's all in the story. They construct a gate. They shoot to a point with all the ships that were going. They had to spend a certain amount of time there dismantling the components from a ship to construct another gate to keep hopping. And that was their rudimentary way to traverse space to get from here to there in a fast uh you know faster than light travel or, or subspace kind of concept was we we don't just yeah we don't have ftl drives uh we don't have hyper, hyper drives it's like nope we have to again you bebop is a great example gates go from here to there mm -hmm. that's that's all they go to and you exist in this kind of the subspace dimensional corridor that um without a gate you will be adrift in out of phase with reality. Um, so kind of adopting that, you know, Bebop is another great example of an influence. Um, I was watching that stuff back. Uh, friends of mine brought it back from the jet program from Japan back in 97, 98. I can't remember, but we were watching it in Japanese uh, with only a rudimentary knowledge of what was going on. Just like, Oh my gosh, this is beautiful. Uh, years before we got, you know, subs. Um, a great sci-fi in there. Really, really great sci-fi. Yeah, I'm saying to the absolutely understanding, <laughs> you know, yeah. majority of people out there. Um, and I, and even, even it's just it's just that that's a that's a question that all it's always going to get brought up whenever you're dealing with um, space opera in any in any sense. Uh now, taking now taking th taking that in mind, given given the use of cards, I'm curious how you how you'd handle how you'd ha how you'd handle something like um, Wilds of Enoch if somebody wanted to play this on a virtual tabletop because it's kind of hard to do. It's not impossible to do cards in a virtual tabletop, but um, 
some are going to be harder than others. <laughs> sure. And, you know, I, I was asked that last night. Um, and I, that is on, that is on the, the table of consideration, how to present that and how to make that available. Um, being pretty much a, well, not pretty much being a one man squad at this point, um, which is not excuse. It's just going, okay, my priorities are going to present the material in as uh, reliable and resilient a way as possible. And um, I've got that punch list talking about like editable PDF or editable, but like uh, drop down PDFs and these interactive PDFs and things that I'm like, oh, these would really enhance gameplay for people outside of just a tabletop environment. Um, having some sort of virtual element in my mind I, I anticipate it working i'll come back to the car mechanic part in a second but uh similar to fantasy flights imperial assault uh mini program it was great you know like, here's your, your target priority here's how things play out um very simple uh as far as interaction you know something good that could work like that cards do present their own their own challenge that's why i'm looking at it's skinning it different ways if if there's enough demand like right now I printed the books. I, I made it happen. The the game exists whether the Kickstarter funds or not. You know, I've I've done six, seven years of touring conventions throughout the Southeast from, from Gen Con to Chattacon or mm -hmm. Liberty Con or Dragon Con, whatever it is. Um I it, it's going to live and it's going to continue to grow. And I have some of these concerns placed on like, okay, well, I'm going to keep those connections open or look for technologies that allow me to present that in that way. If the Kickstarter doesn't fund, um, which is perfectly fine, I'm still going to be making the game and it'll be available to people who want to pick it up on the website or want to peruse it in another way. The Kickstarter funds and there's enough of a draw for it that goes like, you know, this is really great. We love the setting. We would really love to see a virtual tabletop then i will scoot that up it's already uh it's already on the list i wouldn't say it's a priority but then it will take more precedence because like oh well people were really clamoring for this option who already will live the environment or i've got this group i want to play there's enough people saying like it would be really great to have this then i'll just i'll just make it more of a priority either invest in it uh if the need's there or develop the connections necessary to to make that a possibility Right now, it's, it's a pencil, paper, card, dice, tabletop game. And it's I, I really am proud of it, and I love it. And it has the possibility, uh, through some rethinking and development, to, to reach audiences outside of that intended effect mm -hmm. through technology or, or uh, supply. Yeah. Now, with that in, with that in mind, um, what, do you, what, what would you say the total page count is at? The total page of the hardback is 244 pages. Mm -hmm. The total PDF count is pushing over 250 just after doing the character creation walkthrough with uh, guides and diagrams. As I um, is getting feedback from a larger level, a big, big push of this that I put in the, the campaign and also on the, um, on the website is to make a living PDF. That's my goal. Uh, there are, of course, going to be limitations. People are like, oh, I thought it was going to be this like. I'm stating my intention is to make a living PDF in the sense that the feedback and experiences I have and other people have um, will be assessed and incorporated into the PDF. So as the PDF, the experience grows and the development grows, uh, thankfully I've got no shortage amount of design or art to throw at it, um, we can enhance the experience. We can qualify it, clarify it, expand modules, rules whatever is necessary the feedback i get i want to take it seriously and put it in there so that paid the pdf is going to continue to grow um all the things we we're talking about before bookmarks uh, which that wouldn't increase the page count but the appendix the indexes um uh, annotations where necessary um you know just making it making it grow and be robust and be a real resource rather than a finite uh presentation so now with that in mind, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date per se, but a ballpark. Release for the hardback book? Um, at the very least, the PDF. Oh, the PDF. Uh, I sh I'm going to have that in the pipeline so that uh, whatever mark I'm on right now, I think it's mark three. Um, 
that'll be released uh, either the day of or the day after funding through the Kickstarter. Um, I've had it available on Drive Through RPG uh, for a while. Uh, it still is up there if you wanted to to pay more for it. Um, or, you know, the Kickstarter's five bucks, um, but that'll be deliverable all, immediately. So that'll be that'll be the first week in February to be to put it liberally, but the first couple days in February, um, and that includes. For people who back the Kickstarter, they're going to not only have the PDF, they're going to have the PDFs of the character sheets, they're going to have the PDF of the card sheets, um, and they'll also be on my short list of people that I'm like, I'm going to, not to say that I'm not going to listen to them, it's I'm going to listen to them more. You're like, oh, you backed it, you were in it, uh, you weren't some anonymous face, I've got your name, um, when you say, yeah, hey, you know, this came up, uh, you know, be like, oh, you're just up, you, you're going to be part of the family at that point. Uh, the hardback book will ship the first week of February, maybe say the first seven to ten days tops if, if shipping supplies become an issue or something like that. Um, but the book's already printed. I, I self-published those, self-paid for them. They came, came in from uh, KS Printing in October um, because I knew I was going to do it and I was committed to making the project happening and having the books on the shelves. Um, so they exist whether the Kickstarter funds or not. All right, which is another big bonus, you know. Kickstarters, you're like, oh, this will ship eventually. You're like, no. Nope. If you back this, you're going to get your goods as as fast as humanly possible. As soon as I get that backer report and I start filling it out, filling out uh, shipping labels, um, I'll be making m multiple runs daily as necessary to get the stuff out. Lord knows nobody wants another star citizen. Oh, I'm not familiar with that. I'm, I'm not kingdom of death. Uh, veteran, or uh, say confrontation that's never going to fund, or never going to be so fulfilled. Um, Don't... Kickstarter's awesome until they're not. Uh, although in, th in those kind of, more often than not in those kind of situations, um, I blame Kickstarter less, and I blame the people, I blame whoever was running the Kickstarter more. Oh, absolutely. No, Kickstarter Kickstarter is just a forum um, that has its own flaws, but in general... I've also had phenomenally fun Kickstarters that were like, man, it was so awesome to be a part of this story, to get, uh, you know, get swag. Stretch goals, are, are, they're a blast. You know, I'm getting ready to announce mine. And, you know, I, I hope we make it to stretch goals, because if we do, it just means more awesomeness for everybody. Um, uh, yeah, you know, Kickstarter can be really great. It's when you see people who either don't know what they're doing or have no intention of doing what they said they're going to do, um, that it becomes... Well, like that's people Kickstarter or life, you know, and generally people that don't follow through on their word, you're like, oh, bummer. I'm a big fan of achievable goals and making sure I know how I'm going to get from A to B, especially if other people's time, money or support is on the line. Yeah. And. With, and with that in mind, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops. Oh, but with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Oh, thank you. No, I clearly had <laughs> Rails. Rails exists for people who's willing to stay on them. I, I appreciate you letting me uh, get off topic and and get uh, get wherever we got to. It, it was uh, it was a real treat, and I, I appreciate you just extending the invitation. Um, it is really exciting to connect with people who are doing things and part of things instead of just being um, part of the insulated and insular communities that I that I tend to gravitate uh, towards. And this is, this is just great. Thanks so much. Yeah, and of course, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, I got that sense, and I've been doing it all along. Uh, I, I, again, I, I'd be happy to. Uh, I, I look forward to you checking out the game. Um, if other, other people want to support it, that's super cool. There's plenty of ways to do that at a cost-effective place. Uh, it isn't about the cash grab. It's really about having made the thing and sharing it with people and, and also sharing their response. And sometimes that, that, that stings a bit. Um, but if it's robust, it, it can weather that storm, and it can be better for the connection. Mm-hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. 
But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!